Well, um, man, for those of you that were in Caleb's last session, Poison and Praise, that was, that was so good. Isn't he awesome? I think he's awesome. Uh, he's my husband. Um, I'm Rachel Culver, and just super, super honored and blessed to be here and to get to share with you guys. Um, I, you know, they make you come up with a title for your workshop way in advance. And I was struggling to think through it. And actually my friend, um, Anna Asbury, her and I had, you know, originally maybe planned to do something together. And so we're trying to come up with the best title for this. And, and you know, you kind of want people to come to your session. And so you want the title to, you know, be awesome and get people to come. So we thought, you know, maybe reckless housewives tell all. <laughs> they wouldn't let us do that one. I don't know. So um, since that's not what I'm going to share, we went with prophetic worship. And I am just so, <laughs> it is such a near and dear topic to me. And, you know, we, we're here because we're worshipers, each one of us. And I, I'm just kind of floored, honestly, that I get to do this and spend this time with you guys and share what's on my heart. And I, I usually, when I have a microphone, I don't get to talk. I sing, and I'm so much more comfortable singing in front of people than talking. And I think I shared with my husband earlier, too. I'm like, I don't think I've ever talked for an hour straight ever. So uh, y'all are in for a treat? Maybe? I don't know. We'll, we'll just have to see. Okay, so prophetic worship. We're talking about prophetic worship, and I just want to set some groundwork for, for this session. And so a couple things that we have to kind of agree on, right? So the first one is God is speaking. God speaks right? We have, to, we have to believe that. And I know that I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in a room and I'm being broadcast to like-minded people, but it is so important, though, that we, that we agree together that, that God is speaking. Not that he spoke, but that he is speaking. That's huge. Two, God is speaking to us, his church. It sounds almost the same, but that subtlety is, is, is a really big point. God is speaking to us, his church. Number three. Three. God is speaking to you, making it personal. Because a lot of us in the room, yes, God speaks. He speaks. I believe it. And yeah, God speaks to his church. He loves the church. He's speaking to the church. But then three. God is is speaking to you. Sometimes that one's a little bit harder because we're like, well, I haven't heard him speak in a while. Is, is he speaking to me? But these, those three things, I just want to set up as the groundwork before we dive into prophetic worship. And when we think about prophetic worship, sometimes we kind of think about, I don't know, I guess some of the like stereotypes of prophetic worship is once prophetic worship starts, it just gets weird or, you know, it just, I don't know, the flowy, the flowiness and it's weird. But I want to just like demystify prophetic worship, make it really, really simple for us. So when we say yes to the invitation to partnership with the Holy Spirit in the context of worship, that's when we're entering into prophetic worship. I said I was going to keep it simple. That was a really long sentence. I'm going to say it again. When we say yes to the invitation to partnership with the Holy Spirit in worship, that's when we enter into prophetic worship. So this is worship from a place of response to what he is doing, saying, and prompting. Right? So we have to believe that God is speaking, and he's speaking to us. To, to do this. So worship, I would say, I'm going to, I'm, I'm more of a teacher, I think, than a preacher. So I'm going to repeat things. It's going to be really fun. You're going to learn it. It's going to be great. So worship from a place of response to what he is doing, saying, 
and prompting. And then two, allowing space for him to speak and lead our times of worship. And then one more, th one more thing on demystifying this idea. So in the context of worship, we are revering and adoring God, right? Worship. And then we're making room or space for the testimony of Jesus to go forth, right? Because that spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit comes and inspires utterance. Okay, this is point, I don't know, B, C, D, I don't know. Whatever it is on your, on your piece of paper that you're writing. Take notes, take notes. Engaging in prophetic worship is for everybody. It's not just for the chosen or the few or for the singers or for the musicians. This is for everybody. So I wanna, I wanna share with you a not true story, but it's a good one. So let's just say it is February 13th and everyone knows what happens on February 13th. For me, I am in Meyer. And I am looking in the Hallmark section and I'm like, where's the card that says everything that I want to say to my husband and tell him that I love him? And we'll be honest, I never find the card. Have you ever found the card? No, it doesn't exist. But for my story to work, let's say I find the card, okay? Let's say I find the card and oh my goodness, it's kind of like the glowing lights around the card. I'm like, oh, I found it. And I, I pick it up and I read through it and I'm like, this is, this is everything that's in my heart to say. And I get it and I buy it, I run home, I'm rushing home, I'm always rushing. And I sit down, sign my name, put it in the envelope, sealed, done. Like, I won, February 13th, I won. February 14th comes around and I walk up to my husband and I hand him this card and I'm like, oh, this is gonna be good. And I hand it to him, oh, wait, no, wait. I don't hand it to him. I, just to heap on the romance a little bit, let's say I open it for him and I read it to him. And it's like, roses are red, violets are blue. And I just, I just read words that somebody wrote for me to express what's on my heart. And it's beautiful, right? And he's like, oh, thanks, babe. I love it. Love you. Okay, fast forward. Two weeks. And... He, he comes to me and he's like, oh, I just, I don't know, tell me, tell me how you feel about me. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I got it. And I rush to the nightstand and I'm fumbling through and I find the card. And I run back over and I pull it out and I'm like, <clears throat> roses are red, violets are blue, right? And I read in the card and he stops me halfway. He's like, yeah, 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 I love that. I love, like, beautiful. I want to hear today the response of your heart to me. I want to hear today how you feel about me. I want to hear the new language. I want to hear what's moving your heart in our relationship. Yeah? You guys know where I'm going with this. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> Paul, in Ephesians 5, he, uh, he calls this idea spiritual songs, right? Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, Psalms being the Bible, um, the, the Psalms, and when he wrote that, it would have been the um, first five books of the Bible, right? The Pentateuch. So the Bible, singing, singing the Psalms. Two would be hymns, not talking about almighty fortress, Isaac, although that one's good. Not necessarily hymns, but songs crafted by man, right? Songs, hymns, Three, spiritual songs. Okay, so this analogy of that Hallmark card moves into the idea of spiritual songs. What is flowing out of our hearts to the Lord? <clears throat> so I want to throw this idea out for us today, the idea of going off script. <clears throat> so um, we have some really, really gifted songwriters right now in 2021, right? We are, the church globally is pumping out worship music. We're pumping out songs like never before, and they're incredible. I am not here to, to bash them. It's, it's such a gift from God to 
have these professional songwriters craft us language to express what's on our heart to the Lord, because that can be really, really hard, right? And they do it so wonderfully. They're professionals. Um, but they're Hallmark cards, and they are a gift, and they are a tool, and apps like, hear my heart? Absolutely. I love the Hallmark card. Um, but there is something else that we can give the Lord, and that is the response of our heart today, how we feel today, what he's done today, and then our response back to him. So this idea, right, of going off script, um, think about another way to, you know, look at it is think of, um, you know, we're all act, like actors, they have scripts, and we read the script, and we, you know, do our part, and, but sometimes they improvise, right? Sometimes they go off script, and I, there are times in our worship um, where we kind of move into this idea of responding to the Lord right, right away, right immediately with just our heart. Yeah? You guys with me? Okay, let's turn to Exodus 14. I want to share with you. Man, so many, of you, so many of you guys missed my joke at the beginning. It was so funny. That's okay. Just ask somebody. Ask somebody and they'll, they'll tell you. I'm funny, but I was only planned to be funny at the beginning. So, <laughs> okay. Exodus 14, everybody there? Um, good. Okay, we're actually going to look at Exodus 15, but 14 is super good. I'll tell you what happens in Exodus 14, and then we'll get to Exodus 15. So, we have the people of Israel, and they have been enslaved, right, for 400 plus years at the hand of the Egyptians. And so the people of God have been in a season of their life, and their worship has looked like this. Help, God, we love you, but help, right? Or, you know, like whatever their worship songs are, they're crafted for that season. And so they're, ha they're having worship services in the midst of their trials. And, um, and, then, and then God breaks in. Exodus 14, right? We've got the plagues of Egypt and miracle after miracle, sign and wonder, and they find themselves now at the Red Sea. And then in Exodus 14, 13, Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you. And then what do they see? The Red Sea splits. They walk on dry ground. And then the horse and the rider, you guys know that song, the horse and the rider are thrown into the sea. So that brings us to Exodus 15. So let's just, let's just, I'll paint the picture. So we, we are the Israelites, and we've just been set free. Our people have been set free for 400 years of slavery and captivity. And all of a sudden, what's in our heart? Like, it's like God did this. What do we want to do? We want to worship, right? We want to praise. We have to say something. Our, like, like, we must worship in this moment. Like, we have just, this is huge, right? You guys feel this with me? This is huge. And so what do they do? They're like, okay, what are our worship songs that we have? The, like, help, Lord, whatever one that I sang before. It's like, this is, this is a new thing. And here's a point. I don't know. 24. <laughs> When God does a new thing, the people of God sing a new song. And this was the time in their history to sing a new song. And the songs that they had before, are, they're still going to be in the repertoire, right? They're going to they're gonna go back to that song because those songs are like Ebenezer, right? Here, um, here I've come this far. Uh, and so they're going to sing those, those worship songs and they're, they're going to move the Lord's heart. But... In this moment, it is time for a new song, right? And so what happens? Moses, in Exodus 15, he gets up and he sang this song to the Lord and he led the children of Israel in it. I will, this is 18 verses. I'm going to just paraphrase a little bit of it. I will sing to the Lord 
for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise him. My Father's God and I will exalt him. In your greatness of your excellence, you have overthrown those who rose against you. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like, like you, glorious in holiness? There's new language here. This is a different song. This is a new song. Okay, and so they, he, he sings this song, and then we see his sister, the prophetess, Miriam, and I just see her. She's like, because it's like the, you know, like the men are singing and then the women, like, I guess that's what they were doing then. We did that too back in the 90s. You guys remember those songs? We did that too. We can't hate on them. So, so Moses and the men are singing their song and I just, Mary, oh, you guys can't see me. Miriam is sitting and she's just like eyeing her timbrel, her tambourine. You guys, tambourines, right? She's eyeing it. And she's like, oh, I got something to sing. And so what does she do? She sings the first ever recorded prophetic chorus, right? She hears the song of Moses and then she jumps in, answered him, this idea of responsive singing, responding in the moment. And she says, sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea, right? So this is, um, hmm. when God does a new thing, the people of God sing a new song. And then we see another point that I want to just bring up about prophetic worship is prophetic worship. I'm going to, this is, I'm jumping ahead, but it fits right here, is not synonymous with spontaneous. And a lot of times we think it is, Right? But Miriam getting up and singing that prophetic chorus, it wasn't spontaneous because she had heard it. However, I don't know, she heard it earlier when Moses is singing it. And she hears it and she's like, that's the chorus. And she sings it. And my guess is they sung that new song well into the night, right? They've got the bonfire going. They're on the other side of the Red Sea. It's not time to travel. It's time to worship. And they just sing that same song over and over and over again. So when God does a new thing, the people of God sing a new song. So I want to, um, I, so I, I said before, I'm a teacher. I like to be super practical. And I'm going to probably be too practical in this session, but singers and musicians and worship leaders, y'all will maybe thank me. So I want to talk about four R's. Request, receive, release, and rest. So I'm kind of jumping into entering into prophetic worship, okay? Entering into this idea of creating space for God to speak, because we believe he wants to speak, we believe he's speaking, we believe he's speaking to the church, and we believe he's speaking to us, and so we believe that he wants to even speak in the middle of our worship, right? So we're worshiping and we're singing to him, but he's like, I want to speak to you too. I want to say something in this time. Your heart is open, right? Cause, ooh, because music opens our heart, and he's like, in this moment, when your heart is the most open to me, I want to speak. I want to deposit something. Or, or I want to highlight actually what I want you to sing back to me. Isn't that so interesting? The partnership of worship. It's not just us coming up with our own thing. He's like, tell me I'm awesome. Right? Tell me that I'm the Prince of Peace. And then I'm going to bring peace. But tell me at first. Worship me because I'm full of peace. Or tell me I'm worthy. Yeah, sing it again. Sing that chorus, holy, holy. Like, that's partnership in worship, right? That's, that's moving into that idea of prophetic worship. So, so number one, request. I have the word ask, but then I thought of the 4R thing. And I feel like preachers do the alliteration thing. So I'm trying. Guys, I'm trying for you. Okay, so request, but ask. I like the word ask. You do not have because you do not ask God. James says that. 
when we slow down enough to ask, this is when we are slowed down enough to listen. It can be so hard to slow down enough to listen, right? Because if we're big talkers, we talk. And if we're not big talkers, our brain's talking, right? The thoughts and the da da. So when we slow down enough to ask, that's when we're slowed down enough to listen. And when we're requesting, I want us, we, we need to be requesting often, not just once. Matthew 7, 7, right? Ask, and it will be given. This is a spiritual principle. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open for you. And here's, here's an interesting one. Ask, not just on the stage. Ooh! How many of you have gotten to your worship set and you, you know, you arrive? And you're like, okay, what are we doing? God, what do you, I, I don't know. I've, I've, had, I've been doing my thing and now, okay, let's, I'm ready, I'm ready to ask. But no, let's, let's ask often and let's ask before, right? Ask because we want to be God's friend, right? Exodus 33, 11, this verse is, is intense to me. But God spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And if that's the relationship that God had with Moses, I believe he wants to have it with me. I believe that. Exodus 33, 11, it messes me up. I want to be a friend of God, just like Moses. That's my heart. I, wa I want to speak to him as a man speaks to his friend. I want, um, I want to love to listen. God loves to speak. Do we love to listen? Do we know how to slow down enough to listen? So I'm going to do something. <laughs> I'm going to have us listen. I said I was practical. I want us to take a second, and I'm going to walk you through some of what happens to me. I first have to stop talking, right? Step one, <laughs> to listen. Shh. <laughs> but step two is, is, get, is get my thoughts to settle down, right? Because, you know, and I'm a mom. In the back of my head, I'm like, I got one kid in school right now. My dog is somewhere, and I've got grocery. I mean, there's just a running thing happening in my head. So whew, dial down the talking, dial down the thought life, and listen. So I actually want us to take a second, and I want you to just ask the Holy Spirit to speak. And I just want us to listen for a second. And right about this point, we get uncomfortable because you're wondering if I'm going to share again. But let's just, let's just go a little longer. He loves to speak, and he's always speaking. Good. Okay, now I want you to pull out your pen, your journal. If you spoke something, if it was a verse, maybe a word, go ahead and write it down. I don't want you to forget it. I'm going to keep going, but I want you to maybe like star, like do this activity again. <laughs> okay. Um, so ask before the stage, right? We want to catch the wind of the Holy Spirit on our sail so we can follow his lead. We don't need to go against the wind and forge our own path because he's leading us somewhere, even in worship. And when our sail catches the wind, or like a real sailboat catches the wind, it's effortless. I don't see striving. I just, oh, the sail caught some wind, right? <clears throat> we want it to be second nature, just to hear the voice of God. Okay. Prophetic is not synonymous with spontaneous. I said it earlier. It fit better earlier, I think. 
So we'll leave it there. It was a good point, though. Okay, now ask during. This might be my favorite time to ask. Um, so we're on our, we're on, I'm real, pra- we're going real practical. We're, we're leading worship for a youth group or whatever. And we can ask the Lord right then and there, right? What do you want to do? What are you saying right now in the midst of this worship? What do you, what do you, you know, and what's, what would be my response to that? I want to tell you a story. This one's true, though you might not believe me. I used to play basketball. That's true. I was decent. True. Um, I used to coach basketball, actually. I was a JV, JV uh, girls coach for a quick second. And so let's just, let's, let's bring us back to when I was in seventh and eighth grade. I was playing junior high basketball. And I was good. I was good. I was, you know, like doing all the things and layups and stuff. And um, I was a forward because they thought I was going to get tall. I didn't. I'm 5'7". So I'm, I'm playing basketball junior high. And it's going great. I play 7th, 8th grade. And then ninth grade comes up and they pulled me up to varsity. So now you're like, oh, she is good. But then I have to tell you that my graduating class was only 32. So figure out. Was I good or not? I don't know. But ninth grade, I get pulled up to varsity. And um, I remember I remember the, our first game. And I, I get in, and uh, I, I get the ball. And I'm like, I get the ball. And I have to tell you, the game was so fast right? I had been playing junior high, and it was like, oh my gosh, I'm like dribbling circles around people. And then I get into like varsity, and everyone is seniors in high school, and I'm like, it's too fast. I get the ball, and I'm, I'm in panic mode. Like literally, it is like I'm in slow motion, and everything is happening around me. And I, I finally like hear like our fans like, do something. Like I'm just holding the ball, and I see our like best player on, you know, a ways away. And she, I mean, I can see it in her eye. She's like, pass me the ball. Like, just do something. And I see her and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, this is the move. I'm going to pass. And then the ball got stolen from me. Right? So, uh, it's embarrassing. I'm going to fast. Let's just fast forward. Forget it. Fast forward. I'm a senior in high school now. I'm in 12th grade. So I've had four years. Yes, four years to play on this team. And let me tell you something. The game slowed down, right? I, they realized I was only 5'7", and they moved me to point guard. I'm no longer the forward. <laughs> probably helped. Um, and, but the game slowed down. All of a sudden, I had bandwidth to recognize what's going on. Oh, I know the plays. And, oh, I actually can tell what plays the other team is doing right? And they're, oh yeah, okay, they're doing this, and okay, so my strategy should be this, and um, I'm able, I just have more bandwidth, right? And so in the, I just, I want to share that. I'm going to bring us back to worship. I want to share that and just, I don't know, some of us are leading or we're in ministry, and it just is like things are happening around us, but um, it, it, I, I have found, so I've been leading worship, I don't know, 20 years, and I, when I, when I get up and I lead worship, I, I, I realize, oh, I was going to share another funny story. Um, it is, it is slowed down, and I'm able to hear the voice of the Lord in the midst of doing all the signs, and the like, go to the top, and play the bridge, and all, all of those things, and worrying about dynamics, and the lyrics, like, that's the hardest one, but then, I'm able to ask, and I, he- I can hear the voice of the Lord just speaking even in the midst of worship, right? Because it kind of slows. I'm not having to think. I, I know how to sing now. I, I play the piano too, and so sometimes I'm, you know, back when I was trying to play the piano and sing and do all the things, like I'm thinking about the chords. I can't, I don't have time to ask, right? But it's as we, as we work on our, like, skill and musicality and all of those things, and we practice hearing the voice of God in secret, Right? then we hear his voice and we're able to, able to move on it because we have the bandwidth, right? We've got, we put in the time, we put in the practice. Um, so I was going to share 
check my time. Yeah, we got time for another funny story. I wanted to share with you my first ever time um, on a worship team. <laughs> That's great. I'm, I don't get embarrassed easily. So I was, um, I don't know, sixth grade, something like that sixth or seventh grade and I just like joined the youth group at my church I'm so pumped and it's awesome and man these like 12th graders are just like rocking the worship and it's awesome and then I get I get pulled aside by my youth pastor and okay so we lost our bass player I'm like oh yeah that's bad okay so we were thinking what if you like we know I was taking piano lessons from his wife so why don't you like play the bass on the piano. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I was so willing to serve. I'm like, okay, that sounds great. So I like show up and it's just the left hand and you know, the piano players, I was like, you know, 14 or something. And it's like, not, I'm not very good. So it's like just the bass parts. And I don't know how, I don't know how they let me, they let me do it for quite a few months before they're like, let's just, just stop. We don't need a bass. <laughs> we don't need a bass player. So yay, yay for that. But let me, okay, but during that time, it was going so fast. I didn't, you know, I didn't have the bandwidth to like be, I was literally like G, G, C, C, G, 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 like, and, mess, and messing that up, right? But as time went on, you guys, you guys are getting this. This is just more for fun. As time went on, like here we are, and it's, I've got, I've got, somehow it's slowed down. The songs haven't slowed down, right? But it's the it's breathing in his presence. It's, I've been practicing different skills. You know, our teams have been practicing and it's like, oh, there's some space there, right? Um, sweet. Basketball. Listen, okay, R. Let's go to the second R. Uh, receive. Listening, right? We kind of, I kind of like blended these a little bit together, but create space to listen in your prep times and in your worship sets. Some of my most precious times with our teams here at Radiant have actually been rehearsals. In our rehearsals, we're creating space to hear the Lord, hear what he wants to say, you know, in the, in the next service or even just to our own hearts in that moment. What do you want to do, God? You're speaking. You're always speaking. You're speaking to your church. You're speaking to me. What do you want to say? So creating that space um, and practicing what to do in, the, in that space, right? And no striving in that, in that receiving and listening. Um, and something that we say to our worship leaders um, and our teams all the time is, you know, if it's, if it's not there, don't, you don't need to force anything, right? It's not about striving. It's not about forcing something or making something up just to, like, fill space. Like, no! <laughs> no! <laughs> don't do it! Um... What we mean, okay, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, we don't just sing something random hoping it goes somewhere, right? That's not prophetic worship. I've been there and done that, though, and it never works. Um, so there's no need to fill space just to fill space. But when he speaks, we lean into the whisper, right? We allow our sail to catch that wind. Um... Okay, release. Really, really practical. <laughs> Once you step off the cliff, commit to your cliff jump. This is huge. Okay, so once, right, so the Holy Spirit's speaking to you and you feel like, oh man, I want to, he wants to release peace in the room or he's, you know, he's just, I just, the, I feel the theme of peace, right? And then you decide, I'm going to, sing something or I've got a chorus about peace and we're going to go there, right? Or, or maybe we're just going to like, right? And then I'm just going to tell the instruments. Let's just kind of, I don't know, I do some hand motion that looks peaceful. Okay. Oh yeah. Peace. And we just chill, right? But if I kind of like do it and I'm one foot in, one foot out, and then all of a sudden my leadership is confusing because I'm like, peace. I'm singing and I get right I get nervous or whatever I try to like go for something and then I hesitate so once you jump off a cliff keep falling okay 
don't go back to don't go back to the edge if you go for it really go for it okay and now team ministry in the midst of prophetic worship and because I've seen I know I'm talking to musicians I'm talking to pastors in here so team ministry in the midst of prophetic worship is trusting each other I'm trusting that you're listening to the same Holy Spirit I'm listening to I'm leaning into each we're leaning into each other there's this um, idea of humility in prophetic worship there aren't superstars right we're we're doing this together no rogue superman worship leaders um man something i've just enjoyed so much about our musicians is they love jesus they love jesus and they're listening to his voice and they're showing up at rehearsal saying i just i feel like god is speaking this to me and it's like oh my goodness yes that's what that's what god's doing this is beautiful um and I'm, I'm trusting, right, that they're hearing the Lord and we're trusting each other. And then, I'll, and then we're in the middle of worship and I hear the electric player. Like we're in a moment of space and I hear something and there's life on that. It's just this beautiful melody all of a sudden. And I'm, I'm trusting and I'm leaning. Oh, the Lord's breathing that beautiful melody, right? And this idea of team ministry, right? It's not about people with microphones, you know, doing it. It is team ministry. And so drummers, like play us into breakthrough yeah and and electric guitar players those melodies that you've been practicing at home that just there's life on it bring it into the church right like lead us into that beautiful melody that sparks a chorus and so many times how many of you guys have been in these services where the musicians just something happens right it's the holy spirit he's moving and he's breathing and they play and it's like well no one needs to say anything the Lord is moving on hearts all across the room. And it is this idea of those prophetic musicians taking their place of authority as Levites in the house and ministering to the Lord first. And then the Lord comes and he does his thing in the room. So making space as a team to listen to each other and notice, you know, what, what's going on. And then, and then the power of the chorus. So I talked about Miriam, right? I love Miriam in Exodus 15, and she does this course. But there is, um, this is, okay, I'm going really practical, but in our prophetic worship, helping, because it's prophetic worship, but we're also doing corporate worship. And we wanna help keep that worship corporate. And the chorus, the idea of a chorus is just the most um, simple way to get the room engaged. Does that make sense? Because if I'm singing about something and it's like it's taking off or it's not taking off, sometimes it doesn't take off and it's like, oh, okay, well, let me sing a chorus. And then, I, then unity comes, yeah? So power of the chorus. And then for your listening pleasure, I am going to, um, we good? Okay, great. My guy is not back there. Awesome. Um, I want to do something a little bit different. I actually have pulled a few um, prophetic worship moments um, just, just from the past. I think most of them are just from the past like couple of weeks. Um, maybe one's a little bit older. But I want to talk about just four. These are four. Um, hmm, maybe ways that the Lord uses these prophetic worship times. The, the first one I talked about was in, instrumental, right? This just the music um, ushers in the presence of the Lord and we don't need to say anything and it, the Holy Spirit is saying something. God is speaking directly to the hearts. Yeah? I don't have a clip for that one. But if I did, it would be good. <laughs> Two is our voice to God. So our you know, our, you are holy, you are this, you are that. A lot of times we think of it's prophetic, so it's got to be God's voice to the people, right? But I want to start with just our voice and adoration to the Lord. Is that response, it's that Hallmark card again, right? It's just me telling the Lord who he is, and it's, it's that response of my heart, it's that spiritual song in the moment, not, you know, going off a of script. So, okay, let's play that first one.
just so powerful and I I met that that clip right there it starts out um, I'm messed up the clip but it starts out just with this simple like piano part just kind of playing a little melody and then um, the worship leader Greta she's hearing that and the Lord is just like moving on a melody it's that song right you come in on you ride in on a melody is that there's some life on that melody. And they had just come out of, um, you were worthy of it all, right? That song. And she's, she's just feeling, oh my goodness, the worthiness of Jesus. Like, let's look at him. And, and so she sings, you know, that melody line that the, the musician played. It's this partnership, right, in prophetic worship. And then she sings this chorus, and the whole room just is ushered into this next level, this deep level of worship as we're responding right then to what the Lord is doing in the room. So that's um, our voice, right, to God, singing straight to him. So we have instrumental, declarations of truth, our voice to God, and then this last one should probably be God's voice to us.
situation of my life in this moment? Like we need to ask that question at that moment. Because there's a lot of evaluations <laughs> that people are willing to give you, but it's his evaluation in that moment that matters. And so this idea of rest coming back to the heart of the Lord. Um, and it's kind of a fun thing, again, practical part of rest that, that we like to do is something called a debrief after worship times. We surround ourselves with truth and encouragement. We want to combat the natural tendency at the end um, of our times of worship to self-deprecate, right? We do that. Um, excuse me. So every team member should be contributing affirming words from time to time to build this unity and this culture of positivity and holding each other up, right? Team team, um, team dynamics. Uh, we can't build a culture of prophetic worship if our debriefings, or when we're done, look like times to cut each other up for mistakes and highlight them, right? If we do this, no one will risk jumping off the cliff. Yeah? It's already hard enough to jump off a cliff. Um, good. Okay. I, let me see. I gotta check my time. Oh, we're so good. Okay. Hang with me. I kind of, oh, man, I, I really went out of order, guys. Let's do this. So I wanted to talk about discerning the moment, and you know, we, we're good. We're good discern the moment. Got it? Okay, good. Great. We got it. Okay, we're going to turn to Mark 14. We'll end in this passage. This is my favorite story. Let's see, Mark 14, and we're going to start in verse 3. <clears throat> I'm going to read it. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. And there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, Why was this fragrant, fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you do not have always. Verse 8. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for a burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will always be told as a memorial to her. So Mary of Bethany, she comes into this house. And she begins a prophetic worship service. She comes in and she breaks open this vial of costly perfume. And she's leading worship in this moment. And in verse 8, um, she has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. It's so, it's so cool. The Lord tells us that. Jesus, he says, this is this is why she's doing this. This prophetic worship that we're seeing right now, like I'm, when I am on the cross, I'm going to smell like that fragrance. I'm going like, oh, it's, just, it's so good. And hmm, the disciples don't enter in to this prophetic worship service, right? They stand off to the side. These are the good guys, the ones that start the church later on. They say, where is it? They say stuff. She shouldn't have done it. They criticized her sharply, right? They stood by and at worst were worship critics. At best, they were merely observers. Would we be ones who engage in worship? Would we be ones who engage in this idea of prophetic worship? of responding to the voice of God in our worship. It's as simple as that. Releasing the testimony of Jesus as we worship, giving him space to do what he wants to do and say 
what he wants to say? Would we have eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit is doing? And would we respond to it in our worship? I'm just going to, I guess I was praying a little bit. I'm going to pray just to close. God, I just, I'm just so in awe of the partnership that you long to have with us. And God, we thank you that you're speaking, that you're speaking to the church and that you're speaking to us. And Father, would you give us ears to hear and eyes to see. God, would we enter into what you're doing and saying on the earth, Father? God, I lift up these these prophetic musicians and singers and worship leaders, pastors, youth leaders, Father. I ask that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to believe, and would you give us courage to release what you're wanting to do, what you're wanting to say, Father. We, we say yes to responding to you. We say yes to singing and lifting our voice. We say yes to playing our instruments in a way that is pleasing to you. We, we make room. We carve out space. And we ask that you would speak. In Jesus' name, amen.